Let's get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this AMA session with Professor Arthur Gervais. Uh, professor Gervais is an assistant professor in the Decentralized Systems and Security Group at the Imperial College London, and uh, it will soon be joining the University College London as an associate professor. He's an expert on DeFi topics and will be particularly talking to us today about stable coins, but also other topics in DeFi. Uh, we've got a great set of questions today. Uh, Arthur, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Vivek. I'm going to start by asking uh, some questions on the topic of oracles. Oracles are, of course, a very uh, important component of most uh, stable coin uh, constructions. Uh, they also uh, potentially, uh, you know, uh, impact the decentralization or lack thereof of stablecoins. So, as an interesting start, I want to ask about how you think uh, oracles impact uh, the the decentralized nature of uh, you know DeFi, which is supposed to be decentralized finance. Uh, specifically, uh, you know, are oracles fundamentally centralized? If they are centralized, do, does this fundamentally uh, impact the trust assumptions uh, of uh, decentralized finance? Right. Um, so, so to to elaborate on this question, maybe we should take a, a little bit of broader view first. Um, so, why do we need oracles? Um, an oracle is a mechanism by which you can um, write external data external uh, data, data that is external to a blockchain into a blockchain um at least most often that's that's what an oracle is referred to or more more generally speaking if a smart contract would like to read some data um from another smart contract or external blockchain data we need some kind of a mechanism to facilitate this uh, communication now let me first start with uh, with uh, an oracle that is external to the blockchain, and later we're going to look at an, ex uh, an oracle that is internal to the blockchain. So an external oracle, how could that be realized, right? What could we do? Well, Vivek, for instance, right? You could be a trusted person to report the weather status in Berkeley, right? Every Every day, whatever, at lunchtime, you perform a blockchain transaction, and you let everyone know, well, it's shiny, um, it's warm. Uh, you, you quantify the, 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 the temperature and you, you, you send this transaction on chain. So now every, um, every dApp that is on chain can uh, choose to trust your reporting. It can choose to trust you as an Oracle um, and uh, perform any decision-making based on your, uh, on your Oracle report, right? Um, that's that's a possibility. Now, here it's where, where it gets tricky because that this is uh, you are a very trustworthy person, but maybe not everybody would like to trust one single entity, right? Maybe maybe we want to have multiple people. Then actually, everyone here in this in this call, right? Everyone at uh, at noon in Berkeley could try to report the weather, right? So we could have hundreds of people reporting the weather and then we can hope that the majority of these are um are correct uh they're benign and, uh, they're not, not malicious and are reporting the truth right so you could think of decentralizing the oracle by having a committee uh, of additional uh sources right so that's that's always possible so there's this um there's this tension between you can have you can have an oracle that's that's done by a few entities or by a single entity, but you can always like decentralize or broaden it by having a wider set of participants. Um, so, and that, that's what what's typically is happening. So many oracles out there are not done by a single entity, um, or if if they're done by a single entity, then they give permissions to other entities to update uh, the state of an oracle. Right? So that's for blockchain external oracles now let me move towards the blockchain internal oracles um, so for instance um, very practical use case if your dapp your decentralized application would like to um, 
uh, or requires the price of some particular particular coin, let's say the um, whatever the um, the USDC coin, right? It would like to know what's the current USDC price. So hopefully it's one dollar, uh, but it could be slightly above. This could be slightly below, um, and maybe we want to have the uh, the uh, as well the Ether exchange rate. So what you could do, you could look at the, for example, the Uniswap market. Uh, remember, we had we had a great discussion with Dan Robinson on Uniswap, where Uniswap pools can be used as a price oracle, right? So you could, for example, take the spot price of Ether against US dollar USDC, um, and this will give you uh, this will give you a price, and that's that's a form of an on-chain oracle. Now. The fundamental issue with such a spot price reporting for an oracle is that this is rather easily manipulable, right? So you could, for instance, you could um, um, you could uh, sell um, on this very market a substantial portion of ether, which would lower the ether value um, in that pool uh, instantaneously. And if you then take the the spot price, it may, may be much lower, but other markets in the in the overall market may not have yet adjusted through arbitrage. Um, so you actually, in that particular case, you would be um, vulnerable to flash loans. So it's it's quite tricky. So what's being done is to um, use a so-called time weighted average price, where you can stretch out the uh, the median or the mean of the uh, spot prices uh, that a particular Uniswap market, for instance, has seen in the past. Uh, this will make you a bit more resilient against manipulation attacks. And I mean, in, in my opinion, at least, such an Oracle appears to be really decentralized um, because there's not a single entity controlling the price, right? It's the entire market who influences this Oracle result. Um, so, Definitely. So to conclude, long, long, long discussion, short, uh, short conclusion. The oracles are crucial. Um, they can be centralized. They can also built to be decentralized, uh, both external from external blockchain data as well as internal blockchain data. Great. Well, thanks for the uh, fantastic overview of of oracles, committees, uh, centralization, aggregation. This was a great uh, overview to start with. Uh, in one of your examples, you mentioned that, you know, I, if I was an Oracle, I can go and uh, every, every day, every 24 hours, uh, upload uh, the weather. And this is a fairly realistic example. I think or, uh, Ampliforth, for example, has uh, adjustment every 24 hours. Um, uh, now, how is that time determined? How frequently should an Oracle uh, be updating um you know, uh, updating data, whether it's on-chain or off-chain Oracle. Um, and is there a fundamental limit to how often that Oracle can be uh, updating data in a blockchain? Uh, and what are the sort of trade-offs associated with the frequency of an Oracle uh, updating price information, for example? We had a couple of different questions on this area. Mm, yeah, definitely. Um, so the short answer is it depends. Uh, and um... The bit more longer short answer it mean, uh, is it depends on the application um, that, that we're looking at. Um, so in some cases, uh, 24 hours may be um, uh, too slow. Um, in some cases, you may need uh, much quicker updates. Uh, we will, I think, discuss later an update frequency of 10 minutes, which is still too slow. Um, and in some cases, probably it's enough to update every week, maybe even less, right? So, I mean, in for example, in Bitcoin, if you think of it, in Bitcoin, the difficulty of the chain is adjusted every two weeks. And you could think of this being an oracle, right? Because you, you check like the last 2014 blocks, I believe, what was their difficulty? Do I need to increase or decrease the difficulty? So it really, this, this update frequency or these magic parameters that we are choosing for the essentialized applications are, are very application dependent. Um, and the difficulty, the challenge for uh, designers of these systems is that the update frequency sometimes should be significantly faster than, than what was chosen. Um, so it's likely that the dynamic updates uh, 
um, possibility wouldn't be that bad. And that's still like ongoing research, I suppose. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not something that has been clearly uh, defined or identified. Um, so now going back to your example for Ampleforth, since this is today a stablecoin AMA. Um, so we have looked at, um, at Ampleforth, right? And uh, it does uh, do the, the adjustment every 24 hours. And so we could think like, what was the advantage of going faster? Well, the advantage of going faster is that we may be more realistic. We may be more um, real time, so to speak, right? Um, which is maybe a good thing because there is uh, less discrepancy if the market moved significantly in the last 24 hours, which is good because these rebates can have a significant impact on arbitrage among different markets, right? If the price, if the if the expansion or the contraction is significant in ample form, right? Remember, in ample form, the the supply is either extended or or compressed depending on on its price. Um, so a, a shorter interval would be great because then the discrepancy, the potential discrepancy in volatile regimes wouldn't be that hard, right? Um, but what's the drawback? Well, the drawback is that we will have a higher on-chain overhead, right? It means we need to push more data on chain. Um, this will increase the costs of this update mechanism, um, especially in times of um, blockchain congestion, the, these costs may, may, may be exacerbated, right? So in terms of blockchain congestion, maybe it's better to, to be a little bit slower just to make sure we get the update in every 24 hours because if, the, if we have it like every, whatever, 10 minutes and the blockchain is badly congested, maybe we don't get an update in. So what happens then, right? So it's, uh, it's an undefined state uh, maybe of this protocol. Uh, so these kinds of exceptions, these, these edge cases need, need to be thought about um, just to make sure that the stable coin is, is fine, uh, or at least, uh, yeah, at least we tried it to be fine. Um, so I'm personally not aware of any analyzers that, that has looked at these rebase intervals and how to choose them. Um, definitely amazing future research that I can recommend here, here in the, in the group. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's, that's definitely future work. Right, it's interesting in, in DeFi, there's always you know, trade-offs with these parameters where you have to find a optimality point rather than you know, just having a, a maxim maximization, like faster is always better, it's rarely the case. So definitely an interesting course project idea uh, if you look at the, the frequency of updates for, for oracles. Um, and we're going to switch to looking at uh, attacks, uh, and, and these uh, could be uh, based on oracles or speculative attacks that could cause a stable coin to uh, depeg from the underly uh, underlying asset. Um, I think we'll look at a, a specific example shortly, but first I want to ask you if you could give a general overview of speculative attacks and what are the existing uh, countermeasures that we uh, know about to defend stable coins against speculative attacks. Right. The, so the name speculative attack is actually quite uh, quite funny. Uh, at least to me, it doesn't it doesn't tell me much in the first uh, in the first um, uh, in the first glimpse when I when I hear speculative attacks. However, um, it it implies some kind of a volatility, right? Uh, it implies some kind of somebody will perform some trades expect some outcome um and i guess that's where the name comes from maybe maybe somebody can can correct me if, if they if they have a better understanding of the history of this term um but as far as i know there are kind of like two options in 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 uh tackling these speculative attacks that try to bring down uh, a currency or a stable coin more broadly speaking right so one is where um, you have some some kind of a, some kind of a monetary supply, which like like a like a reserve, um, which is basically just money uh, in a given currency to protect this currency, right? Or or you can also have different currencies uh, to protect your 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 specific currency. Um, so what happens in traditional markets, for instance, is that you have, for instance, the federal Res federal reserve. Um, and they may need to buy enough of their domestic currency to defend their domestic currency pack uh, against external um, uh, currencies. So in essence, it's where you have a protocol that needs to have 
sufficient resources to counter um, such an attack, such a speculative attack once detected. Um, so the, the Terra Luna case is a specific example of um, or where, where this is supposed to have happened. Um, again, we have no like definitive, uh, definitive, um, how to say, a manifesto or, or, or um, confirmation of any attacker in most cases, but we do see significant traits. And if I say significant traits, I mean traits on the order of uh, hundreds of millions of uh, US dollar, um, which is substantial uh, in, in at least in, in DeFi uh, at this stage. Um, so the second uh, way to potentially uh, defend uh, uh, stablecoins against speculative attacks is to develop develop some sort of an algorithmic stablecoin, um, which may or may not be partially collateralized, um, and that hopefully probably can remain at an equilibrium, right? Even if it does face a speculative attack, I suppose there will always be some limitations that you need to account for. Um, so this is definitely an open area of research, right? Uh, we have not the perfect answer yet. Uh, we need to, we're still looking for optimal designs um, and um, I mean, optimal designs or uh, impossibility results. Um, so that's still something that uh, is, not, is not fully explored and, and very, very uncertain, so to speak, not stable. It's interesting that you know uh, the speculative attacks are sort of a, a self-fulfilling prophecy in a way where you know people think the the coin is going to fail and so they you know withdraw and then cause it to fail. It's almost the equivalent of a bank run in in DeFi. Mm -hmm. um, so to to give a more specific example of this, uh, we have the 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 Iron stablecoin, right? The Titan protocol. And um, I don't know if you consider this to be a speculative attack per se or, or something else, but um, you know, there was, I guess you can start by uh, describing this two token mechanism that underlies the Titan protocol. And then of course we know that this uh, ended up uh, failing in practice. And so uh, maybe give a, a brief case study of why this failed despite the mechanisms which were supposed to uh, prevent its failure. Of course, right. So the, um, the this particular project, this iron project, um, is similar also to other projects like Frax. So this is like on a um, this is not something unique as a design, but um, more broadly speaking, um, we can build stable coins by um, collateralizing an asset, right? Um, so in MakerDAO, for instance, for to create a die, you could collateralize ether. Uh, or you can collateralize other 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 cryptocurrencies, right? USDC, uh, etc. Now, the the uh, peculiarity here in this particular uh, stablecoin that we are looking at now is that you are uh, collateralizing um, two tokens um, at a given ratio. So, so these two tokens, uh, one of them is a stablecoin, uh, ironically speaking. <laughs> And the other one is a more volatile coin, and these two, um, you you need to you need to deposit these two in a given ratio that the smart contract of the stablecoin requires. Right? And um, so this ratio, in turn, is determined by uh, by an oracle. Um, in this particular example, with uh, with a time weighted average price oracle that updates every ten minutes. So. Quick recap, we have a stable coin, which we can create by collateralizing two coins, one stable and they have to be collateralized in a given ratio, which is given, which is predetermined by the smart contract and the smart contract can do so because it has access to an Oracle to determine the price between these two uh, collateral coins. And that's basically the, the mechanism of the, how, how the stable coin, um, how the stablecoin collateralizes its asset. Now, if if the uh, stablecoin uh, in this particular case it's called Iron, if the stablecoin is worth less than one dollar, one US dollar, right, then anyone can return one Iron to the smart contract, and uh, will get one dollar worth of these two collateralized tokens. In our example today, that's USDC and Titan. So USDC, as you 
uh, Meno is a relatively stable reserve baked stablecoin. So it's pretty close to $1. Whereas Titan, uh, it's a volatile coin. So this one may fluctuate more significantly. Right? So quick recap, if, if the stablecoin iron is worth less than $1, uh, what we can do is we can give iron to the smart contract and we get back $1 worth of USDC Titan a combination. So why, why does this help? I mean, what's the point of, of giving back the stablecoin to the smart contract? Well, if the if the stablecoin is that one unit of the stablecoin is less is worth less than one dollar, um, but we can give it to the smart contract and retrieve one US dollar worth of tokens, that means that this is an arbitrage market, right? There's an arbitrage opportunity. I can make a profit if I have a lot of iron. Well, I will give it to the smart contract and I get the, the US dollar equivalent, um, even though the value of the iron token itself may not be. Uh, may not be a uh, US dollar equivalent. In, uh, in the other case where the, um, where the iron token is worth more than $1, right, then anyone can mint one iron token by depositing $1 worth of USDC Titan into the particular, this particular smart contract. Okay, so this was just a recap on this particular um, mechanism, which we already discussed in lecture, but it's good to have like different explanations or different angles on on the content. Yeah. So I hope I hope this is clear at least how the how this uh, mechanism works. Now the question is, why did it DPEC? Right? What happened? Um, and if you want to investigate a stablecoin, which you should definitely, um, please look into, into all other stablecoins that you can get a hold of and, and try to find under which circumstances can we identify a spiral, and in particular, a downward spiral. So a downward spiral is something where you, you have some amount of money, you do an action, you get something back, which yields a profit for you, and then you repeat. Right? So that's like a spiral. So in, in general, in these cases, in these systems, if you make a profit, somebody else will be losing some coins. Right? Um, and if you can, if you can re-execute this spiral repeatedly, well, this is kind of like a downward spiral in, in eyes of the stable coin or in eyes of this DeFi protocol because eventually you will drain all the funds. Right? So in the case of, of iron, what happened is that let's assume, um, let's assume there was a big, uh, there was some whale, uh, they traded and, and tried to um, uh, lower the price of, uh, of, the, of the Titan token. So the trust in the this, in this stable coin already um, dropped, so to speak, right? So it could happen that there is some market out there where Iron now traded at ninety cents instead of one dollar. Right? So this can this can happen if there are significant trades and quantifying the significance depend obviously on the market sizes, the volume, etc. Um, but let's assume right uh, we we've got there already because somebody sold a significant amount of Titan. Then um, with one iron, we can go to the smart contract and we can get one dollar worth of uh, USDC Titan, right? This combination that we mentioned earlier. And let's assume now, and this is here, I think this is where it gets a bit technical. We assume that the price oracle um, was not yet updated. We have this 10 minute time frame, and trades can happen on, on high frequency trading exchanges, right? Centralized exchanges that operate uh, orders of magnitude faster than the blockchain, right? So if, if that happens, uh, the price oracle on chain with a latency of 10 minutes can just not keep up. Right? So you may, you may actually get um, you may actually get more tokens um, uh, from, from, the, from the particular smart contract. Um, and by basically getting more tokens back, um, you can repeat the cycle, right? As long as the price oracle is not updated. And this is where I, I believe the, the actual issue comes about, right? If you, if you identify these cycles, these this spirals, um, and you can execute them repeatedly, it's just too late for such a stable coin. 
Yeah, that that goes back to our you know previous question about um, the frequency at which Oracle should be uh, the price Oracle should be updating the data. So this is a great example of what you know could go wrong if the wrong frequency is is chosen there. So it's a, it's good to have a concrete example for that. Um, so just staying on the topic of of uh, algorithmic stable coins, uh, I want to start by by talking about sort of the birth of an algorithmic stable coin. So you mentioned that the, the value of algorithmic stable coins depends on you know, having users to perform these arbitrage operations um, to maintain the price. And, but someone has to be the first user in a way. And uh, at that point, there's very little value on the coin because there's no one else to maintain the price. So how do these, you, you would imagine these stable coins would never come into existence because there's no incentive to use them initially. Um, so can you talk a little bit about sort of the birth of a stable coin, what's in it for the first few users and how we in DeFi do we look at solving this problem uh, in general of um, you know, getting some momentum on a new uh, DeFi project before there's enough uh, users to sustain its value? Right. Um, what, what's quite quite interesting, and I mean, this is uh, this is probably something that that stablecoin issuers are are realizing is that the stablecoin, at the end of the day, is really a social construct, as a social mechanism uh, to exchange a value, um, and maybe non stablecoins too, um, or, or maybe they're more speculative nature. I'm, I'm yeah. I, I'm not. I'm not sure. Uh, and again, this is all not financial uh, uh, or legal advice here. But um, the so the, the the stable coins are have a value if your friends and your family and your uh, markets that you interact with, your shops that you interact with, um, if they accept the stable coin, right? So the more entities accept your stable coin the better for the stablecoin because the more value, uh, the more utility uh, you can extract from having uh, a, a particular uh, stablecoin. Um, so it, it, in essence, it's quite similar to a social network, right? Or uh, to the telephone network, right? If you if you have a telephone network, but you can't call anyone, I mean, what's it good for? So um, that means these, um, these networks, uh, benefit from the so-called network effect and um, gain an increase like an exponential amount of value the more users join the network all right depending on your market size depending on whether you look at social networks telephone networks stable coins etc um, the there's likely a critical mass that you can quantify that is required for a stable coin for instance to be successful now the question is, how do we get there, right? Um, and I think there are probably uh, two answers um, to that, and 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 many shades of gray in between, I guess. So one answer would be to, um, if you, if you bring out a product that is a zero to one game per piece of feel, um, it is something that's orders of magnitude better than anything out there, right? Then you. You have you have a good chance of getting organic growth, right? And this is also something. These are kind of the, the 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 things you should be looking out for, right? How can I create something that's just so good people will want to use it? They will be worth to mouth. I don't need to spend uh, much much capital on marketing because it's just so good, right? Um, and so th that's the one answer, right? So if you bring out, for example, a stable coin or something that's like just too good, then it it may just seek adoption by itself through through the utility it offers to people. If you bring out a product that's not too differentiable from existing products that may already have network effects, it's going to be really hard, right? How do you get people on board? I mean, why would you why would you um, why would you use a product um, that you have never touched, that you don't know is issued, that, that you, you don't know where it's issued from? Um, why would you spend the mental energy to verify whether it's safe to adopt this product if you already have one that's maybe slightly worse? Right? Uh, I mean, probably you won't do it. Right? So the only way to, or, or one of the ways to motivate people to use your product in that case would be to 
give them a financial incentive so that you need to pay them to get on board. Um, and the, the harder it is to get on board, the more you need to pay them, right? So this may work initially, right, for a few clients, but the moment you want to scale uh, to millions, it's going to be uh, impossible to finance. So, um, or, or hard to finance. I don't like the word impossible. So almost nothing is impossible. So, um, <laughs> yeah. So you may, you may very likely need some VC investments to, uh, to get bootstrapped. And uh, yeah, this bootstrapping problem is, is a recurring theme, like also in blockchains and layer two systems, in, in dApps, in, um, um, I mean, why do you think people are doing airdrops, for instance, right? This is a, definitely a way to distribute access uh, to get an initial growth and with the hope, I guess, um, or to, to attract the wider crowd, I suppose. Yeah. All right, and, and and for students who are interested in yeah reading more about um, networking effects and how they might uh, apply to DeFi, Metcalf's law is uh, is the general term for this effect. Um, you know, originally in telephone networks and and later describes uh, social media and so on. So that's a good thing to look into if you're interested in in uh, exploring this bootstrapping problem further. Uh, staying on the topic of you know the uh, the birth of stable coins and the origin of new stable coins, uh, we got a couple of questions from students about the the future of stable coins as a field. So specifically, um, given what we know about uh, past performance of stable coins, which ones have done well and which ones have failed, um, do you think the the uh, you know future of stable coins uh, is uh, in the you know, more towards algorithmic stable coins, uh, fully collateralized, partially collateralized, or some combination of both, and maybe users can choose what they prefer. Uh, have we seen, you know, strong trends in this field to indicate um, the, the, what the future of stable coins uh, is likely to look, uh, look like? Right. I mean, predicting the future is challenging, but we can see some uh, empirical evidence today um, that uh, the existing protocols don't seem to be sufficiently developed, right? Um, so at least that's that's what we believe to be to be true given given blockchain data, right? You can crawl on chain and see see how things look there. Um, so for instance, we have seen we've seen attacks on on stable coins. Uh, we have uh, we have we, I mean just you you can compare for instance how many attacks do we do we see on stable coins how many attacks do we see on dex how many attacks do we see on bridges on yield generators etc right so you can you can rank them you can relatively say how mature are these are these technologies even right? and then you can you can judge for yourself given the data um, which one of these uh, defi protocol types still needs some some work right um, so it seems like that uh, that we're not yet at the at the optimal design, uh, at least at the and on the deployed deployed stages. Um, what's what's interesting in the future is going to be um, the uh, the development of uh, centrally banked digital currencies, or short uh, CBDCs. Right, this is where governments are issuing um, uh, stable coins or their their fiat currencies. Um, we, we don't yet know what kind of uh, impact these will have. Um, we also don't know whether they will become a thing, um, uh, but, but there, may, there, there are some good works out there, research works on, on how to build uh, CBDCs also in a, in a privacy preserving manner. For those of you that are somewhat worried about um, the state seeing whatever you do, which I can understand this, this worry, um, but it's, um, because privacy is obviously an important uh, human right, um, but um, there are sufficient there are sufficient proposals out there. And uh, again, I encourage you. Now is the time to shape the future, right? so you can really make a difference here by contributing, which is uh, which is nice. Um, and um, I mean, I'm still looking for breakthroughs in uh, in algorithmic stablecoins. Um, um, with uh, hopefully with collateralization factors below one, because this renders the uh, the collateral more efficient. Right? We have, um, I think, a fairly decent success in in uh, in stable coins that are over collateralized, uh, the, with the drawback that they are capital inefficient because um, because of this additional capital just to 
to render them more uh, more stable or or less prone to liquidations, so to speak. And speaking of liquidations, um, they are an element, an elementary part of the stablecoin, and as such, um, certainly part of the future research that needs to be done to still design, um, yeah, uh, properly uh, properly ma mature stablecoins. Um, maybe maybe one more small note. The, the term stablecoin is a bit ambiguous, right? Um, nothing is stable in life. Um, and um, yeah, I'm not sure. Maybe we can come up with a better name. <laughs> so now, uh, since we're already on the topic of, um, you know, a, a centrally backed uh, stablecoin or centrally backed currencies, um, I wanted to, uh, to ask you some questions we've received on that topic specifically. Um, more, uh, you know, rather than on the technical side, these questions have been mostly about, you know, the um, the impact that the that specifically a U.S. government-backed stablecoin uh, would have on the DeFi market as a whole, um, whether it would, um, uh, you know, have a, a increase in in trust uh, of uh, decentralized finance, or maybe, you know, maybe the opposite. Maybe it would uh, actually uh, you know, effectively centralize it. Uh, so yeah, if you have any thoughts on whether we're likely to see this in the future, and if so, um, what impact do you think it would have on uh, market participation and other uh, other impacts on DeFi as a whole? Right. Um, hmm. I'm I'm not too sure what the impact may be. Um, I think I think the more choices consumers have, right, the better. The more competition there is, the better. So I I welcome actually every every kind of new solution that's that's uh, that's intriguing that maybe haven't haven't been tried before, um, that may be more liquid, uh, that could be less volatile and sometimes more volatile. I think I think anything that really um, shows shows the desire to explore and to try things out will advance humanity right because we will learn more and we'll understand what are the implications um i mean it could be that cbdc's will offer lower costs lower fees and so on um but we don't know yet yeah it, it really depends uh, it would be pure speculation here uh, on my part uh so I, I i just remain curious so to speak yeah okay great uh we had a we had a uh, you know, interesting case study that you walked us through on uh, the iron stablecoin. Uh, we ha now have a more recent um, uh, example of uh, a stablecoin uh, failure, which is Terra. Um, I'm wondering if you can uh, walk us through uh, Terra as well. This was a, a much more impactful and recent event. And um, so if you can walk us through that attack and also um, any uh, additional uh, lessons we may have learned from that with regard to stablecoin design. Right. So what's what's interesting about the the, the Terra case um, is that it was a it was really a hugely successful stablecoin until its collapse. Right. Um, probably due to um, its promising in a lending and borrowing platform a 20% APY. On the deposited stablecoin, which is um, which is not found anywhere else uh, at the time, I suppose. And, um, so this just explains why the Terra case was really uh, impactful uh, because there was just a significant volume there. Um, now I think the uh, the interesting part of this particular case is the the very beginning um, of of the of the end, uh, so to speak. Um, there was a there was a, a curve uh, three pool. Um, that's a that's a uh, that's a pool where um, you had uh, UST collateralized uh, with with other stable coins, and uh, UST um, the, the the Terraform Labs the the foundation behind um, behind the development of the stable coin um, for for some reason which uh, i think has not been has not been communicated at, at least as far as i know um for some reason in in may beginning of may on the 7th of may 
decided to remove 150 million UST, um, which is not a small amount for, uh, for such a liquidity pool. To give you a bit of a background, Curve is, uh, um, is an automated market maker exchange, which uh, in the three pool case is specialized on packed assets. So all the assets that are in this pool, they are supposed to be close to one US dollar. And because they're close, the, um, the trades that you can do, or the, the, the mechanism of the, of the AMM is optimized for low slippage even given a uh, significant trading volume, right? So that's that's one of the reasons why Curve is, is uh, one of the most popular exchanges for packed assets um, as of now. So if UST removes $150 million uh, from this Curve pool, the um, every subsequent trade that you will do with this pool um, and which involves UST will yield more slippage, right? So I think traders say that the liquidity pool becomes more shallow. Um, if a pool becomes more shallow, the volatility uh, among these coins increases as you trade with the pool. Right? So removing such amounts of liquidity from a pool is not a good thing. Right? It will, it will uh, imply a higher volatility. Right? So we're not sure why this happened, but that, that's the kind of the initial step. And what's striking is that just a few minutes after, I think less than 10 minutes after, uh, someone uh, bridged through a, through, a, through a DeFi bridge, 85 million UST uh, to, uh, to the Ether chain, and then sold this 85 million UST to USDC. Okay. So you can imagine, right? There's like 150 million being removed from a liquidity pool. And then someone coming and selling 85 million. So putting it into the liquidity pool that just got more shallow um, and, um, and, and thereby like certainly uh, debalancing this, uh, this free pool, right? So if you have three tokens in this pool, uh, so UST, USDC and DAI, I believe, right? Then you will suddenly have a, quite a high proportion of UST, uh, UST, but much less of USDC and DAI. And the the ideal composition is 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 a uniform composition where right? where you have one third one third one third of each coin, um, and so this was one trader right. So this is to be believed uh, the first attacker, uh, the first attacker that uh, that tried to um, uh, depack UST, because if you if you dump such an amount in this in this AMM, the the value of UST naturally uh, will decrease compared to other um, stable coins such as DAI and USTC. And shortly after we found uh, there was another trader, I think this happened then um, about a half an hour later, another trader uh, did perform three 25 million trades in the same direction. So also selling UST uh, against USDC, right? So, at this point in time, the so uh, in uh, in this three per, three pool uh, in this uh, curve three pool, at this point in time, the amount of UST was much higher than Dai and USDC. So guess what the Terra Labs um, um, Foundation chose to do, and this was <laughs> uh, surprisingly roughly one hour after they removed the hundred fifty million they choose to remove another 100 million. Um, I believe the idea was to uh, rebalance the pool because it's important that uh, the pool has like, as I said, right, one third, one third, one third uh, of assets. Um, but if you remove more liquidity from the pool, then the pool becomes even more shallow, right? So it's, it's not ideal, right, uh, to, to remove even more currencies. And then funnily enough, attacker number two uh, sold another 25 million USD uh, against USDC. So and this point, at this point in time, um, the uh, USD token um, already depacked, right? So uh, these, these few trades, um, which happened in a, in a time frame of um, maybe an hour, an hour 20, roughly, 
they were enough to destabilize the, the UST PAC. Right? And this is where investors started to panic. Um, so this is really where investors that, that, that were uh, holding UST were, began to worry. Right? And if you have a crowd that starts to worry, um, it's, it's the beginning of the end. Right? So there were, there were a lot of people trying to remove their UST from this anchor platform that I mentioned earlier, where the yield was 20%. And um, it's, it's kind of akin to a bank run, really. Um, eventually, the, the uh, Terralabs Foundation tried to um, recover. They tried to um, use their reserves. Right? We're coming back to the speculative attacks, attacks at the beginning of the, of the lesson today. Um, where with sufficient capital, you can try to, to save your, your currency. Um, they've deployed, I believe, um, first they tried to deploy um, about half a billion of US dollar. Um, uh, this was, uh, this was on, on May 7th, 8th and 9th. Um, and afterwards, um, afterwards on May 9th, the Terra, uh, the Terra, uh, or the Luna, the Luna Foundation guards deployed billions worth of Bitcoin. So um, they, they in fact um, made the Bitcoin price. Uh, they, they significantly impacted the Bitcoin price. I mean, the, the entire crypto system, the eco DeFi uh, or blockchain cryptocurrency system, um, and and all all the tokens uh, lost. Um, lost in, in market capitalization through these actions. So this was really, this was, uh, I mean, everybody got affected at this stage uh, with these volumes. And um, so because UST is, as we've discussed, is a, is a, is a stable coin that was backed by another volatile, stable, uh, volatile coin, right? Not even another stable coin like, like Iron or, or Frax. So it was literally only backed by Luna. And then Luna started to hyperinflate and and crash. Um, so yeah, this was uh, this was then the um, the outcome. Okay, so um, we've discussed now kind of the risk of uh, uh, under collateralized or completely algorithmic um, stable coins, which are um, either uh, yeah either fully uncollateralized or collateralized with other decentralized currencies, not with uh, uh, traditional uh, fiat currencies. Um, and uh, on the other end, we, we have uh, discussed in the past question, um, you know, uh, centrally backed stable coins. And so there's a big um, spectrum of, of stability from, from, yeah, purely algorithmic all the way to um, maybe even over collateralized um, stable coins. And there's uh, risks and rewards for both of those, which are potentially hard for end users to navigate since they're theoretically all called stable coins and should all be holding their value. Uh, what, what do you think about the idea of uh, some kind of uh, authority that uh, gives ratings to stable coins in the same way that we have ratings for stocks and bonds in CFI? Um, do you think there's a, a potential opportunity for um, uh, for uh, some authority to evaluate factors like collateralization ratio and um, rate which stable coins are are really the most stable or most most likely to hold their value. Absolutely, I mean rating agencies are definitely interesting uh, for to to help in the DeFi space. Um, at the end of the day, it's it's up to everyone to really uh, read the code and. Uh, Try to understand what's what's there and and where where you uh, I guess deposit your money or or not. Um, at the end of the day, it's your responsibility, right? Um, I I guess it's it's not fair to blame anyone else but 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 yourself if um, if you're if you're losing money in a, in, in such a system. But um, uh, but you the 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 beauty in DeFi is you can um, you can really. You, you can go into the details. Right? You can read the code. You can try to learn what it means to what what, what it like what this what this what this code is doing. Right. Um, you can try to simulate uh, under what input will you get a certain output uh, in this in this um, uh, in this uh, in the smart contract code, for instance. So 
certainly it's it's nice to have rating agencies and so on but um um but i, I guess there's always a, a component of of responsibility that that is uh, that that should not be um delegated so to speak right um it it like rating agencies can be a good indicator um you can ask believable people uh, to help you judge whether a system is uh, appears sound. Um, but um, yeah, I, I guess one one of the drawbacks of rating agencies is that they're sometimes a bit slow uh, because they like to be conservative. So if you don't want to be conservative, then they're likely not a solution. But if you're fine with being conservative, then then I guess uh, rating agencies can be quite good. Um, or maybe you can build new rating agencies that are just less conservative. Um, maybe we can we can find here um, on how rating agencies work um, due to DeFi's transparency. Maybe there's an opportunity to build new types of rating agencies um, that just uh, that are maybe as transparent as DeFi itself. Um, yeah, that's an interesting open question. And it's another uh, potentially great project idea for any of the, the students in the class. And that's a great thing about being in, in such a, a new field as DeFi, that there's all these opportunities for, yeah, really great ideas waiting to be uh, developed by someone who's interested in, in solving uh, these open problems. Um, so I'm going to end, uh, I, I think we're at a, a, at about an hour now. And um, so I'll, I'll ask, a, I think, what's a good concluding question, um, which is uh, regarding regulation. So, so far, we've um, been uh, discussing a fairly laissez-faire market of uh, all, all these different tokens, which are called stable coins, which actually exist on a wide range of stability. And, and you previously mentioned, you know, that stable coins essentially are a social contract. And, uh, you know, we, we essentially use our trust in the stable coin to maintain its stability to, to a variety of extents, depending on collateralization and so on. It may be easier or harder to trust. But uh, regulations or the lack thereof might be one, one factor that is impacting trust. Um, so do you think that the uh, lack of, of regulations currently is uh, decreasing trust in stable coins and therefore making them uh, less concretely efficient with respect to collateral? Um, and, and therefore, do you think there's an opportunity for, for regulation to actually increase the, uh, the stability and efficiency of stable coins? Or would that, again, be against the ethos of, of, uh, of the decentralized nature of DeFi? Mm. Yeah, regulations are are a very interesting point uh, in this space, and uh, I would like to extend my 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 gratitude, uh, obviously, to to regulating bodies that try to understand the DeFi space, that speak to experts, that try to um, that try to see whether existing frameworks can or cannot apply or could be modified to be applied. Um, I mean, there's. This is this is naturally happening all over the world in different le legislations. We have um, uh, we have, for example, in Switzerland, right? And Switzerland was one of the first countries to um, implement token standards, right? So you have different types of token standards um, that are very clearly defined. And uh, as a, as an entrepreneur, you can ask your 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 lawyer that gives you then a paper in writing what kind of token. Uh, if I were to create this type of token, what, what kind of uh, token would this qualify to? So it's it's quite um, it's quite remarkable how how some legislations are really at the forefront of of trying to understand this technology, even if they're maybe not like computer scientists or economists or finance uh, people. So it's uh, th this is really remarkable, right? So I I really appreciate any any regulator that's trying to uh, find the right solution here. Um, I believe to understand that the goal of regulations is to protect um, investors or, or users of, of these platforms, uh, if there's such a thing as investment. Um, and in general, in, in general, users can, um, I mean, likely should, should be able to choose, right, whether they would want to be protected or not. I guess um, it depends. There are different types of people. Um, some some want to be more independent. Some want to be 
uh, are seeking more help from third parties. So it's good to to cater to different tastes and different um, different goals of of uh, of of users in general. Right? Um, one particular worry I understand that regulators have are information asymmetries. So an information asymmetry is, for instance, if I know something earlier than you do about a given um, event that may be financially relevant. Right? So there's, uh, there's always some information asymmetry out there. Um, and I, I, I have, from my understanding and from discussions I had also with regulators, they're doing. They're asking the right questions by now, which is great. Um, they are looking into information asymmetries and how to minimize information asymmetries, or if they exist, how to how to try to um, um, apply the the principles or the the same kind of um, methodology or or overall goal as in traditional finance, even if the methods may be very different, right? Um, so it's uh, this is I think if if you're a lawyer right now and you want to shape uh, future policies in this respect, that's just great. You can really change the world, right? Um, yeah, it's the right time. Okay, well that was the last question that I was really hoping to to ask. So uh, did you have any other questions that you noticed from from students um, or uh, you know on EdStem or chat even? that you were uh, really hoping to, to answer? So I don't see any in the chat at the moment, but uh, something we have not discussed, I believe is um, uh, this, what are the drawbacks of complexity? Um, for example, in, in, in AMMs or stable coins in general. Um, and I think that that's a good one. Um, complexity is, um, is um, how to say, <laughs> It, it, it can be fun uh, to think about, um, but but it's the it's a security's enemy, right? So from an information security perspective, the more complex the system becomes, the more likely you will have some bugs like in the implementation, maybe even in the design. So whenever you come up with some solution, um, try to keep it simple, right? Uh, there's this famous 80-20 rule where uh, with with 20% uh, of the effort, you get 80% of the way. Uh, and to finish the last 20%, you may, may need to spend 80% of the time, which is uh, often too much, right? Uh, or as Elon Musk says, many engineers are optimizing something that shouldn't exist, right? So always try to think, do I need something? Do I need the system? Is it maybe just too complex? Should we just cut things? So should we simplify? Uh, and just ship, right? And just meet the deadline. Um, so I thought this was a, quite a quite a nice, um, more general um, um, question in this regard. Yeah, that's a, actually a great point that, you know, when you're making a risk calculation for a stable coin or any contract, you know, it's not just uh, the obvious things like collateral that go into the risk calculation, but even uh, things like complexity uh, subtly impact the risk that is involved in a stable coin. So that's an uh, important point to mention. Uh, were there any other questions that you, you were hoping to answer today? Oh, yes. Uh, Rahul just asked a question in the chat. Uh, let, me, let me phrase it uh, quickly. So asking customers to read the code is a significant barrier to entry for participating in the DeFi ecosystem. Is there a concept of a blockchain simulator or testbed where DeFi smart contracts could be deployed and tested under various scenarios. And I agree, Rahul. Um, it's um, like, like reading the contract and fully understanding its details is challenging even to experts, right? Um, so that's definitely, definitely a challenge. Um, I still think people could have a look into the basics. They could have a look into, um, into common metrics, right? So when you design metrics to, um, to evaluate um, uh, a DeFi protocol or uh, its security, you can, for example, look, okay, who audited the smart contract? Uh, what's the number of lines, right? You can just ask, what's the number of lines, right? Everyone can ask this, right? Um, what's the, uh, how much, how much does it cost to perform a transaction? What's, what's the, 
what's the uh, what's the monetary amount I need to to pay to perform an action on the DeFi protocol, right? And these these metrics they will give you some indication, right? Um, because because the more it costs to execute an action, the more complex it is, the more likely there are some bugs. Right? The more lines of code there are, the more likely there are some bugs. Um, so even though it's it's hard to read the code, you can ask some very simple, um, again, this 80-20 rule, right? Some very simple questions that give you relatively interesting answers uh, that you can uh, that you can then be aware of, right? And you can do this without without consulting even an expert or a third party in in most most cases. Um, but coming coming back to your answer, whether there's a test bed or a simulator, um, as far as I know, there's no simple way to test or simulate things uh, for non-technical people. For for technical people, yes, there are plenty of test beds or test nets simulators. You can you can deploy things on your on your local machine. Um, but it does require some technical expertise. Okay, and that kind of goes back to our original point of, you know, maybe a good way to solve this would be for experts to develop a rating system. And uh, so, yeah, definitely an open area of research for people who are interested in doing research in this area. So I'm in the interest of time, I don't see any other questions in chat. Um, thanks so much again for, for joining us and for, for all your help in the course so far. You've been a, certainly an integral part of the, the DeFi MOOC. And uh, thanks also to all the students for, uh, for joining us and for submitting questions. It was a great discussion. Thank you so much also for the technical questions. I had to look up quite a few things myself and I learned more myself. So thanks for pushing the boundaries here. All right, excellent. Have a good day, everyone.